Chapter 28 of North and South. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hi, this is Cassie. I am in Chicago, and I will be reading Chapter 28 of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. Through cross to crown, and though thy spirit's life, trials untold assail with giant strength. Good cheer, good cheer, soon ends to bitter strife, and thou shalt reign in peace with Christ at length. Rose Garden Ah, sooth, we feel too strong in weal to need thee on that road. But woe being come, the soul is dumb, thy crieth not on God. Mrs. Browning that afternoon she walked swiftly to the Higgins house. Mary was looking out for her with a half distrustful face. Margaret smiled into her eyes to reassure her. They passed quickly through the house place upstairs and into the quiet presence of the dead. Then Margaret was glad that she had come. The face, often so weary with pain, so restless with troublous thoughts, had now the faint soft smile of eternal rest upon it. The slow tears gathered into Margaret's eyes, but a deep calm entered into her soul, and that was death. It looked more peaceful than life. All beautiful scriptures came into her mind. They rest from their labors. The weary are at rest. He giveth his beloved sleep. Slowly, slowly Margaret turned away from the bed. Mary was humbly sobbing in the background. They went downstairs without a word. Resting his hand upon the house table, Nicholas Higgins stood in the midst of the floor. His great eyes startled open by the news he had heard as he came along the court from many busy tongues. His eyes were dry and fierce, studying the reality of her death, bringing himself to understand that her place should know her no more, for she had been sickly, dying so long that he had persuaded himself she would not die, that she would pull through. Margaret felt as if she had no business to be there familiarly acquainting herself with the surroundings of death which he, the father, had only just learned. There had been a pause of an instant on the steep, crooked stair when she first saw him, but now she tried to still pass his abstracted gaze and to leave him in the solemn circle of his household misery. Mary sat down on the first step she came to, and throwing her apron over her head, he began to cry. The noise appeared to rouse him. He took sudden hold of Margaret's arm and held her till he could gather words to speak. His throat seemed dry. They came up thick and choked and hoarse. Were you with her? Did you see her die? No, replied Margaret, standing still with the utmost patience. Now she found herself perceived. It was some time before he spoke again, but he kept his hold on her arm. All men must die, said he at last with a strange sort of gravity, which first suggested to Margaret the ideal that he had been drinking, not enough to intoxicate himself, but enough to make his thoughts bewilder. But she were younger than me, Dilly pondered over the event, not looking at Margaret, though he grasped her tight. Suddenly he looked up at her with a wild, searching inquiry in his glance. You're sure and certain she's dead? Not in a dwang? A faint? She's been so before, often. She is dead, replied Margaret. She felt no fear in speaking to him, though he hurt her arm with his grip, and the wild gleams came across the stupidity of his eyes. She is dead, she said. He looked at her still with that searching look which seemed to fade out of his eyes as he gazed, and then he suddenly let go of his hold on Margaret, and throwing his body half across the table, he took it in every piece of furniture in the room with his violent sobs. Mary came trembling towards him. "'Get thee gone! Get thee gone!' he cried, striking wildly and blindly at her. "'What do I care for thee?' Margaret took her hand and held it softly in hers. He tore his hair, he beat his head against the hard wood, then he lay exhausted and stupid. Still his daughter and Margaret did not move. Mary trembled from head to foot. At last, it might have been a quarter of an hour, it might have been an hour, he lifted himself up. His eyes were swollen and bloodshot, and he seemed to have forgotten that any one was by. He scowled at the watchers when he saw them. He shook himself heavily, gave them one more sullen look, spoke never a word, but made for the door. Oh, father, father, said Mary, throwing herself upon his arm. Not tonight, any night but tonight. Oh, help me, he's going out to drink again. Father, I'll not leave you. You may strike, but I'll not leave you. She told me last of all to keep you from drink. But Margaret stood in the doorway, silent yet commanding. 
He looked up at her defiantly. It's my own house. Stand out of the way, wench, or I'll make ya. He had shaken off Mary with violence. He looked ready to strike Margaret, but she never moved a feature, never took her deep, serious eyes off him. He stared back at her with gloomy fierceness. If she had stirred hand or foot, he would have thrust her aside with even more violence than he had used to his own daughter, whose face was bleeding from her fall against a chair. "'What are you looking at me in that way for?' asked he, at last, daunted and awed by her severe calm. "'If you think for to keep me from going what I gave, I choose, because she loved you. And in my own house, too, where I never asked you to come, you're mistaken. It's very hard upon a man that he can't go to the only comfort left.' Margaret felt that he acknowledged her power. What could she do next? He had seated himself on a chair, closed the door, half conquered, half resenting, intending to go out as soon as she left her position, but unwilling to use the violence he had threatened not five minutes before. Margaret laid her hand on his arm. Come with me, she said. Come and see her. The voice in which she spoke was very low and solemn, but there was no fear or doubt expressed in it, either of him or his compliance. He sullenly rose up. He stood uncertain, with dogged irresolution upon his face. She waited him there, quietly and patiently waiting for his time to move. He had a strange pleasure in making her wait, but at last he moved towards the stairs. She and he stood by the corpse. Her last words to Mary were, Keep my father from drink. Can I hurt her now? muttered he. Knock and hurt her now. Then raising his voice to a wailing cry, he went on. We may quarrel and fall out. We may make peace and be friends. We may clem to skin and bone, and not all our griefs will ever touch her more. How's her portion on him? Will we hard work first and sickness at last? How's that the life of a dog? And to die without knowing one good piece of rejoicing all her days? Nay, wench, whatever who said, who can know not about it now, and sup drink just to steady me against sorrow? No, said Margaret, softening with his softened manner. You shall not. For life had been what you say, at any rate, she did not fear death, as some do. Oh, you should have heard her speak of the life to come, the life hidden with God, that she is now gone to. He shook his head, glancing sideways up at Margaret as he did so. His pale, haggard face struck her painfully. You are sorely tired. Where have you been all day? Not at work. Not at work, sure enough, said he with a short, grim laugh. Not at work, you call work? I were at the committee till I were sickened out with trying to make fools hear reason. I were fetched to Boucher's wife at four seven this morning. She's bedfast, but she was raving and raging to know where her dunder-headed brute of a chap was, as if I had to keep him, as if I were fit to be ruled by me. That a, that fool who has put his foot in all our plans, and I've walked my feet sore were going about for him to see who men wouldn't be seen. Now the law is raised against us, and I were sore-hearted too, which is worse than sore-footed. And if I did see a friend who else to treat me, I never knew who a lion dying here. Best last day, believe me, thou wouldn't, wouldn't thou? Turn into poor dumb form with wild appeal. I am sure, said Margaret, I am sure you did not know. It was quite sudden. But now, you see, it will be different. You do know. You do see her lying here. You hear what she said with her last breath. You will not go. No answer. In fact, where was he to look for comfort? Come home with me, she said at last with a bold venture, half trembling her own proposal as she made it. At least she shall have some comfortable food, which I'm sure you need. Your father's a parson, asked he with a sudden turn in his ideas. He was, said Margaret shortly. I'll go and take a dish of tea with him since you asked me. Many a thing I often wish to say to a parson, and I'm not particularly as to whether he's preaching now or not. Margaret was perplexed. His drinking tea with her father, who would be totally unprepared for his visitor, her mother, so ill, seemed utterly out of the question, and yet if she drew back now, it would be worse than ever, sure to drive him to the gin shop. She thought that if she could only get him to their own house, it was so great a step gained that she would trust to the chapter of accidents for the next. Goodbye, old wench. We've parted company at last, we have. But thou hast been a blessing to thy father ever since thou were born. Bless thy white lips, lads, they have a smile on em now, and I'm glad to see it once again, though I'm alone and forlorn for evermore. He stooped down and fondly kissed his daughter, covered up her face, and turned to follow Margaret. She had hastily gone downstairs to tell Mary of the arrangement, to say it was the only way she could think of to keep him from the gin palace. To urge Mary to come too, for her heart smote her at the idea of leaving the poor affectionate girl alone. But Mary had friends among the neighbors, she said, who would come in and sit a bit with her. It was all right. 
the father. He was there by them, as she would have spoken more. He had shaken off his emotion as if he was ashamed of having ever given way to it, and had ever overleaped himself so much that he assumed a sort of bitter mirth, like the crackling of thorns under a pot. I'm going to take my tea with her father, I am. But he slouched his cap low down over his brow as he went out into the street, and looked neither to the right nor to the left, while he tramped along by Margaret's side. He feared of being upset by the words, still more the looks of sympathizing neighbors, so he and Margaret walked in silence. As he got near the street in which he knew she lived, he looked down at his clothes, his hands, and shoes. I shouldn't have half and cleaned myself first. It certainly would have been desirable, but Margaret assured him he should be allowed to go into the yard and have a soap and towel provided. She could not let him slip out of her hands just then. While he followed, the house servant along the passage and through the kitchen, stepping cautiously on every dark mark in the pattern of the oilcloth, in order to conceal his dirty footprints, Margaret ran upstairs. She met Dixon on the landing. How's Mamma? Where's Papa? Mrs. was tired and gone to her own room. She had wanted to go to bed, but Dixon had persuaded her to lie down on the sofa and have her tea brought to her there. It would be better than getting restless by being too long in bed. So far, so good, but where was Mr. Hale? In the drawing room. Margaret went in half breathless with the hurried story she had to tell. Of course, she told it incompletely, and her father was rather taken aback by the idea of a drunken weaver awaiting him in his quiet study with whom he was expected to drink tea, and on whose behalf Margaret was anxiously pleading. The meek, kind-hearted Mr. Hill would have readily tried to console him in his grief, but unluckily the point Margaret dwelt upon most forcibly was the fact that of his having been drinking and her having brought him home with her as a last expedient to keep him from the gin shop. One little event had come out of another so naturally that Margaret was hardly conscious of what she had done till she saw the slight look of repugnance on her father's face. Oh, Papa, he really is a man you would not dislike, if you won't be shocked, to begin with. But, Margaret, to bring a drunken man home, and your mother so ill. Margaret's countenance fell. I am sorry, Papa. He is very quiet. He is not tipsy at all. He is only rather strange at first, but that might be a shock of poor Bessie's death. Margaret's eyes filled with tears. Mr. Hale took hold of her sweet, pleading face in both his hands and kissed her forehead. It's all right, dear. I'll go and make him as comfortable as I can, and do you attend to your mother. Only if you can come in and make a third in the study, I shall be glad. Oh, yes, thank you. But as Mr. Hale was leaving the room, she ran after him. Papa, you must not wonder at what he says. He's in... I mean, he does not believe in much of what we do. Oh, dear, a drunken infidel weaver said Mr. Hale to himself in dismay. But to Margaret, he only said, If your mother goes to sleep, be sure you come directly. Margaret went into her mother's room. Mrs. Hill lifted herself up from a doze. When did you write to Frederick, Margaret? Yesterday or the day before? Yesterday, Mama. Yesterday. And the letter went? Yes, I took it myself. Oh, Margaret, I'm so afraid of his coming. If he should be recognized, if he should be taken, if he should be executed after all these years that he has kept away and lived in safety, I keep falling asleep and dreaming that he is caught and being tried. Oh, Mama, don't be afraid. There will be some risk, no doubt, but we will lessen it as much as ever we can. And it is so little. Now, if I were at Helston, there would be twenty, a hundred times as much. There everybody will remember him, and if there was a stranger known to be in the house, they would be sure to guess it was Frederick. While here, nobody knows or cares for us enough to notice what we do. Dixon will keep the door like a dragon, won't you, Dixon, while he is here? It would be clever if they come in past me, said Dixon, showing her teeth at the bare idea. And he need not go out except in the dust, poor fellow. Poor fellow, echoed Mrs. Hill. But I almost wish you had not written. Would it be too late to stop him if he wrote again, Margaret? I'm afraid it would, Mamma," said Martha, remembering the urgency with which she had entreated him to come directly if he wished to see his mother alive. I always dislike that doing things in such a hurry, said Mrs. Hale. Margaret was silent. Come now, ma'am, said Dixon, with a kind of cheerful authority. You know, seeing Master Frederick is just the very thing of all others you're longing for, and I'm glad Miss Margaret rode off straight without shilly-shallying. I've had a great mind to do it myself, and will keep him snug if depend upon it. There's only Martha in the house that would not do a good deal to save him on a pension. I've been thinking she might go and see her mother just at that very time. She's been saying once or twice she would like to go, for her mother has had a stroke since she came here, only she didn't like to ask. But I'll see about her being safe off as soon as we know when he comes. God bless him. So take your tea, ma'am, and comfort and trust to me. Mrs. Hill did trust in Dixon more than in Margaret. 
Dixon's words quieted her for the time. Margaret poured out the tea in silence, trying to think of something agreeable to say, but her thoughts made answer something like Daniel O'Rourke when the man in the moon asked him to get off his reaping hook. The more you ask us, the more we won't stir. The more she tried to think of something, anything, besides the danger to which Frederick would be exposed, the more closely her imagination clung to the unfortunate idea presented to her. Her mother prattled with Dixon and seemed to have utterly forgotten the possibility of Frederick being tried and executed, utterly forgotten that at her wish, if by Margaret's deed, he was summoned into his danger. Her mother was one of those who throw out terrible possibilities, miserable possibilities, unfortunate chances of all kinds as a rocket throws out sparks. But if the sparks light on some combustible matter, that smoulder first and burst down into a frightful flame at last. Margaret was glad when her filial duties gently and carefully performed, she could go down into the study. She wondered how her father and Higgins had got out. In the first place, the decorous, kind-hearted, simple, old-fashioned gentleman had unconsciously called out, but his own refinement and courteousness of manner, all the latent courtesy in the other. Mr. Hill treated all his fellow creatures alike, and never entered into his head to make any difference because of their rank. He placed a chair for Nicholas, stood up till he, at Mr. Hill's request, took a seat, and called him invariably Mr. Higgins instead of the curt Nicholas, or Higgins, to which the drunken infidel weaver had been accustomed. But Nicholas was neither an habitual drunkard nor a thorough infidel. He drank to drown care, as he would have himself expressed it, and he was infidel so far as he had never yet found any form of faith to which he could attach himself heart and soul. Margaret was a little surprised and very much pleased when she found her father and Higgins in earnest conversation, each speaking with gentle politeness to the other, however their opinions might clash. Nicholas, clean, tidy, if only at the pump trowel, and quiet spoken, was a new creature to her, who had only seen him in the rough independence of his own hearthstone. He had slicked his hair down with the fresh water, he had adjusted his neck handkerchief, and borrowed an old candle end to polish his clogs with and there he sat enforcing some opinion on her father with a strong darkshire accent it is true but with a lord voice and a good earnest composure on his face her father too was interested in what his companion was saying he looked around as she came in smiled and quietly gave her his chair and then sat down afresh as quickly as possible and with a little bow of apology to his guest for the interruption Higgins nodded to her as a sign of greeting and she softly adjusted her working materials on the table and prepared to listen as I was saying, sir, I reckon you had much belief in you if you lived here, if you been bred here. Ask your pardon if I use wrong words, but what I mean by belief just now is the thinking on sayings and maximums and promises made by folks you never saw about things in the life you never saw, nor one else. Nor you say there are true things and true sayings in a true life. I just say, where's the proof? There's many and many a one wiser and scores better learned than I am around me folk who have had time to think on these things while my time has had to be given up to get my bread while i see these people their lives is pretty much open to me they're a real folk they don't believe in the bible not they they may say they do for form's sake but lord sir you think their first cry in the morning is what shall i do to get hold of eternal life or what shall i do to fill my purse this blessed day where where shall i go what bargain shall i strike purse and the gold and the nose is real things things can be felt and touched them's realities and eternal life is all the talk very fit for i ask your pardon sir your parson out of work i believe well i never speak disrespectful of a man in the same fix as i am in myself but i'll just ask you another question sir and i don't want you to answer it only to put in your pipe and smoke it afore you go for to set down who only believes in what we see as fools and naughties if salvation and life to come and what not was true not in men's words but in men's hearts core don't you think that it is as they do with political economy there's mighty anxious to come around us with that piece of wisdom but their other would be a greater conversion if it were true but the masters have nothing to do with your religion all that are connected with you is your trade so they think now that is concerning them therefore to rectify your opinion and it's the silence of trade i'm glad sir said higgins with a curious wink in his eye that you put in so they think I had thought you a hypocrite. I'm afraid if you hadn't for all your parson, or rather because you're a parson. You see, if you spoken of religion as a thing that if it was a true, it didn't concern all men to press on all men's attentions above anything else in this vast old earth, I should have thought you not for a parson, I'd rather you a fool than a knave. No, no offense, I hope, sir. 
not at all. If you consider me mistaken, I consider you far more fatally mistaken. I don't expect to convince you in a day, not in one conversation, but let us know each other and speak freely to each other about these things, and the truth will prevail. I should not believe in God if I did not believe that. Mr. Higgins, I trust whatever else you have given up, you believe. Mr. Hill's voice dropped low in reverence. You believe in him. Nicholas Higgins suddenly stood straight, stiff up. Margaret started to her feet, for she thought by the working of his face he was going into convulsions. Mr. Hill looked at her dismayed. At last Higgins found words. Man, I could fell you to the ground for tempting me. What business have you to try with my doubts? Think of her lying there, after the life holds led, and think how they deny me the one sole comfort left, that there is a God, and that he set her, her life. I don't believe she'll ever live again, said he, sitting down, and drearily going on as if to unsympathizing fire. I do not believe in any other life than this, in which she dreaded such trouble, and has such never-ending care, and I cannot bear to think it were all a set of chances that might have been altered with the breath of wind. There was many a time when I thought I didn't believe in God, but I never put it fair out before me in words as many men do. I may laugh at those who did to brave it out like, but I have looked round and after to see if he hurt me. If so, be there was a he, but today when I am left desolate, I won't listen to your questions and your doubts. There's but one thing steady and quiet all these really world and reason or no reason i cling to that it's a very well for happy folk margaret touched her his arm very softly she had not spoken before nor had she heard her rise nicholas we do not want to reason you understand my father we do not reason we believe and so do you this is the one sole comfort in such times he turned around and caught her hand ay it is it is brushing away the tears from the back of his hand but you know she's lying dead at home and I'm Willie dazed with sorrow, and at times I hardly know what I'm saying. It's as if speeches folks had made clever and smart things as I've thought at the time. Come up now, my heart's Willie broken. No strikes fail as well, don't you know? That means I were coming whom to ask her like a beggar as I am. For a bit of comfort, I had trouble, and I were knocked down by one who told me she were dead. Just dead. That were all, but that were enough for me. Mr. Hell blew his nose and got up to snuff the candles in order to conceal his emotion. He's not an infidel, Margaret. How could you say so? Mutter he reproachfully. I have a good mind to read him the fourteenth chapter of Job. Not yet, Papa, I think. Perhaps not at all. Let us ask him about the strike and give him all the sympathy he needs and to hope to have from poor Bessie. So they questioned and listened. The workmen's calculations were based, like too many of the masters, on false premises. They reckoned on their fellow man as if they possessed the calculable powers of machines, no more, no less, no allowance for human passions getting the better of reason, as in the case of Boucher and the rioters, and believing that their representations of their injuries would have the same effect on strangers far away as the injuries Nancy the real had upon themselves. They were consequently surprised and indignant at the poor Irish who had allowed themselves to be imported and brought over to take their places. This indignation was tempered in some degree by the contempt for them Irishers, and by pleasure at the idea of the bungling way in which they would set to work and perplex their new masters with their ignorance and stupidity, strange exaggerated stories of which were already spreading throughout the town. But the most cruel cut of all was that of the Milton workmen, who had defied and disobeyed the commands of the Union to keep the peace, whatever came who had originated to score in the camp and spread the panic of the law being arrayed against them. And so the strike is at an end, said Margaret. Ah, miss, it's save as save can. Factory doors we need open wide tomorrow to let all who will be asking for work. It's only just to show them not to do with measure which have been made. The right stuff would have brought wages up to a point that had not been at this ten year. You get work, shan't you? asked Margaret. You're a famous workman, are not you? Camper let me work at his mill when he cuts off his right hand, not before, and not after, said Higginson quietly. Margaret was silenced and said, About the wages, said Mr. Hill. You not be offended, but I think you made some sad mistakes. I should like to read you some remarks in a book I have. She got up and went to his bookshelves. You needn't trouble yourself, sir, said Nicholas. Their book stuff goes in one ear and out the other. I can make naught of it. I for hamper me and had this split the overlook had told me I were stirring up the men to ask for higher wages and hamper met me one day in the yard. He had thin book in his hand and says, Higgins, I'm told you're one of those damn fools that think you can get higher wages for asking for em and, and keep em up too when you're forced em up. Now I'll give you a chance to try if you're any sense in you. Here's a book written by a friend of mine and if you read it, 
you'll see how wages find their own level without either master or men having aught to do with them except the men cut their own throats with striking like the confounded noodles they are when i sir, i put in you being a parson having been in the preaching line and having to try and bring folk to what you thought was a right way of thinking did you begin by calling them fools and such like or did you rather give em some kind words at first to make em ready for you to listen and be convinced if they could and your preaching did you stop every now and then and say half to them and half to yours but you're such a pack of fools and i have a strong notion it's no use my trying to put sense into you i work now as best stayed our own or taking in what hamper's friends had to say i were so vexed at the way it were put to me but i thought come i'll see what these chap has to say and, and try if it's them or me as it's the noodle so i took the book and tugged at it the lord bless you went on about capital and labor and labor and capital till the fair sent me off to sleep never could rightly fix my mind which was which and i spoke in as if they were virtues or vices and what i wanted for to know were the rights of men whether they were rich or poor so be the only woman but for all that said mr hill and granting to the full the offensiveness the folly the unchristianness of mr hamper's ways of speaking to you and recommending his friend's book yet if it told you what he said it did that wages find their own level and that the most successful strike can only force them up for a moment to sink in far greater proportion afterwards in consequences of that very strike the book would have told you the truth well sir said higgins rather doggedly it might or it might not there's two opinions go to selling that point but suppose it was truth double strong it were no truth to me if i could have taken it in i dare say there's a truth to you latin book on your shelf but it's gibberish and not truth to me unless i know the meaning of the words if you sir any other knowledgeable patient man come to me and says who learn me what the words mean and not blow me up if i'm a bit stupid or forget one thing hangs on another why in time i may get to see the truth of it or i may not i'll not be bound to say i shall end in thinking the same as any man and i'm not one who think truth can be shaped down in words all neat and clean as thy man on the foundry cut out sheet iron same bones won't go down with every one i'll stick here as i this man's throne there as i as others let alone that one down and maybe too strong for his one too weak for that folk who sets up the doctors in the world their truth must suit different for different minds and a bit tender in the way of giving it to or the poor sick fools may spit it out in eye their faces now hamper first gets me a box on my ear and then he throws his big bolus at me and says he's reckons it'll do me no good such a fool but there it is i wish some of the kindness and wisest of the masters would meet some of the men and have a good talk on these things it will surely be the best way of getting over the difficulties which i do believe arise from your ignorance excuse me mr higgins on subjects which it is for the mutual interest of both masters and men should be well understood by both i wonder half to his daughter and mr thornton might not be induced to do such a thing remember papa she said in a very low voice what he said one day about government you know she was unwilling to make any clear allusion to the conversation they had had on the mode of governing work people by giving men intelligence enough to rule themselves or by a wise despotism on the part of the master for she saw that higgins had caught mr thornton's name if not the whole of the speech indeed he began to speak of him thornton he's a chap as rode off at once for these irishers and led the riot that ruined the strike even hamper with all his bullying would have hated a while but it's a word and a, and a blow we thorn and now when the union would be thanked for him foiling up the chase after boucher and then chaps as went right again our commands thorn who steps forward and coolly says that as the strike at an end he as partly injured doesn't want to press the charges against the rioters i thought he had more pluck i thought he had carried his point and his revenge in an open way but says he one at court tell me his very words they are well known they will find the natural punishment of their conduct and the difficulty they will meet when getting employment that will be severe enough i only wish they couched boucher and had him up before hamper i see a tiger setting on him would he have let him off not he mr thornton was right said margaret you are angry against boucher nicholas or else you would be the first to see that where the natural punishment would be severe enough for the offence any further punishment would be something like revenge my daughter is no great friend of mr thornton said mr hill smiling at margaret while she as right as any carnation began to work with double diligence but i believe what she says is the truth i like him for it 
well sir this strike has been a weary piece of business to me and you'll not wonder if i'm a bit put out with seeing it fail just for a few men who would have suffered in silence and had brave and firm you forget said margaret i don't know much about her but the only time i saw him it was not his own sufferings he spoke of but those of his sick wife his little children true but he was not made of iron himself he'd have cried out for his own sorrows next he were not one to bear how come he came into the union asked margaret innocently you don't seem to have much respect for him nor gain much good from having him in higgins brow clouded he was silent for a minute or two then he said shortly enough not for me to speak of the union when they does they does them that is of a trade men hung together and if they're not willing to take their chances along with the rest the union has ways and means mr hill saw that higgins was vexed at the turn the conversation taken and was silent not so margaret thought she saw higgins feeling as clearly as he did by instinct she felt that if he could but be brought to express himself in plain words something clear would be gained on which to argue for the right and the just and what are the union's ways and means he looked up at her as if on the point of dark resistance to her wish for information but her calm face fixed on his patient and trustful compelled him to answer well if a man doesn't belong to the union then his work next looms has orders not to speak to him if he's sorry or ill it's the same he's out of bounds he's none of us he comes among us he works among us but he's none of us and some places them's fine as who speaks to him you try that miss try living a year or two among them as looks away if you look at them try working within two yards or crowds of men who you know have a grinding grudge on you in their hearts to whom you say you're glad not an eye brightens nor a lip moves to whom if your heart's heavy you never say not because they never take notice of your sighs or sad looks and a man's no man who'll groan out loud while folk ask him what's the matter just try that miss ten hours for three hundred days and you'll know a bit of what the union is why said margaret what tyranny is this is nay higgins i don't care one straw for your anger i know you can't be angry with me if you would and i must tell you the truth that i never read in all the history i have but more slow lingering torture than this and you belong to the union and you talk of the tyranny of the masters nay said higgins you may say what you like the dead stand between you and every angry word of mine do you think i forgot who's lying there and how who loved you and it's the masters as is made for sin if the union is a sin not this generation maybe but their fathers their fathers ground our fathers to the very dust ground us to powder parson i reckon i've heard my mother read out a text the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge so with them in those days of sore oppression the unions began as a necessity it's a necessity now according to me as a withstanding of justice past present or to come it may be like war along with it comes crimes but i think it were a greater crime to let it alone our only chance is binding men together in one common interest and if some are cowards and some are fools they mum come along and join the great march whose only strength is in numbers oh said mr hill sighing your union in itself will be beautiful glorious it would be christianity itself if it were but for an end with effected the good of all instead of that of merely one class as opposed to another i reckon it's time for me to be going sir said higgins as the clock struck ten home said margaret very softly he understood her and took her off her hand home miss you may trust me i am of the union i do trust you most thoroughly higgins stay said mr hill hurrying to the bookshelves mr higgins i'm sure you'll join us in family prayer higgins looked at margaret doubtfully her grave sweet eyes met his there was no compassion only deep interest in them he did not speak but he kept his pace margaret the churchwoman her father the dissenter higgins the infidel knelt down together it did them no harm end of chapter twenty eight comfort and sorrow